am super excited about today's message, continuing winning the war in your mind. How many of you's life has been changed over the last two weeks? It has been incredible. This is probably one of my favorite life messages here because the most important thing a Christian can do, the single most important thing a Christian can do is to renew their mind. Every struggle, every battle, everything that you're ever going to face can be fixed with a renewed mind. And I'm not speaking hyperbole. Literally, everything you will ever face, if you will renew your mind, you will have a completely different perspective and you'll realize you've already won. It's like Sharon said, we're not fighting for victory. We're actually fighting from the victory. Once we meet Jesus, we're translated from loser to winner. And we can fight from the place of the winner, but our mind will sometimes still think we're a loser. And that's where, and here's the thing, don't feel bad, we all do it. I've been saved for... 35 years now, and there are times that I face things like a loser because I have forgotten to renew my mind in the middle of the battle. Sometimes I'll start a battle with a renewed mind, and it took longer than I thought it was going to, and in the middle of it is when I start to lose the renewed mind. It's, it, when they're quick and easy, we can renew our mind very easily because it's a one-day thing. How many of you have ever faced a prolonged battle, and you had to continually renew your mind in the battle? It is a continual thing. It is not a complete, it is a completed work in Jesus, but our part of it is a daily decision to renew our mind. And now how do we renew our mind? The Bible is so good, you guys. It gives us all the answers. If you ask the question, I guarantee you can find it in the Bible. So, okay, if the most important thing a Christian can do is to renew our mind, how do we do that? The Bible says that we renew our mind by the word of God. And I know I say this every time I get the mic, but the word of God is the source of our life. If you want your mind renewed, you can't hate the Bible and have a renewed mind. You can't ignore the Bible and have a renewed mind. You can't hear the Bible only when I'm saying it to you and have a renewed mind. You'll have a piece of it, but if you want to live in the victory Jesus died to give us, if we don't want to cheapen the price that Jesus paid, then we have got to love the word. People come and sit down with us all the time and, hey, my marriage is struggling here, or I'm struggling here, or my finances are struggling here, or my kid is struggling here. And I can guarantee you who is going to walk out victorious and who is not based on how much they put into the word. If it is just, hey, I don't give me the Bible stuff. Give me something that works. I can, I can work up a victory for a minute, but I can't live in a sustainable life of victory if it is not built on the Word of God. So let's start in the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. They have divine power. We talked about this, I think the last time I preached actually, um, is we live in this world, but we are not of it. So don't come to a heavenly fight with worldly weapons. If you want to lose, then what is the old saying? Yes, that's one too. Good job. Don't show up to a, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You can tell I'm super good with the weapons. <laughs> don't show up to a Nerf battle with a pool noodle. You know, I don't know. Whatever works for you if you're anti-weapon, then make it pool noodles. Whatever you can uh, stomach there. But we don't fight like this world. So many times Christians are losing the battle because we are fighting like we are not Christians. We are fighting like we aren't the sons and daughters of the king of the kings who already finished the battle that we're currently engaged in. So many times we're fighting battles that he never asked us to step into. And all he is saying is just turn your back and look at me and ignore what's happening around you because you're not of this world. You're not in this world. You are of a heavenly nature. Now, how do I know I'm of a heavenly nature? How do I know what my heavenly nature is? It's in the Word. So I love, uh, I'm a word person. I love to kind of study out what words mean. And this word, strongholds, here in 2 Corinthians 2, 4, or 10, 4, it's used figuratively 
Here's what it means. So the Bible says that we have power, the weapons that we possess have divine power to demolish strongholds. Here's what a stronghold is. It's used figuratively of a false argument in which a person seeks, and it's in uh, air quotes, which means it's not right. Uh, A person seeks shelter or a safe place to escape reality. To escape reality. Reality. Here's another thing that it means. It's also used for a prison. So the Bible tells us that we have a choice. Because in Proverbs 18.10, he says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower where I can run into. Interestingly enough, where stronghold here means a prison to escape reality, strong tower means a literal, a literal safe place to find life. So I can run. When, when things come at me, I can run into a prison to escape reality, or I can run into a safe place to find life. And the Word of God gives us the tools to run into the safe place. I, I mean, I'm just honestly, I don't always run into the safe place. Sometimes it feels good to escape reality. It looks like this in our life sometimes, um, ignoring things saying, oh, that's not happening, that's not happening, that's not happening, that's not happening, I don't feel that, I don't feel that, I don't feel that, I don't feel that. And the whole time, you're like, yeah, I do feel that, I don't feel that, I feel that, no, I don't feel that, I feel that, I don't feel that, I don't feel that. It it is a confusing way to live, and it's also a lie. You feel what you feel. You're experiencing what you experience, but how we view what we feel and how we view what we experience will determine the direction of our life. Is think about filters. So we live in a day and an age of filters. How many of you are on Snapchat? Use your little Snapchat filters. Nobody in this room is on Snapchat. It's not evil, you guys. Okay, there's a few honest folks. Thank you. Uh, Instagram filters. Anybody Instagram filters? There you go. Anybody use AutoTune? Face Correct? Isn't that one? Face Correct? Facebook. I think Facebook has filters now. They're trying to keep up with the times. Okay, we, we live in a world, how many of you have, have put that little green screen behind you in your Zoom meetings over the last year to look like you're in Cuba or whatever? Yeah, I've been in meetings with you. It's annoying. Stop doing it. <laughs> we all know you're sitting at your house with your cat beside you, all right? But here, we live in a world where filters are the norm. So filters are how we see things. I want you to look at this. Um, this is my favorite thing that's happening in the world right now. Uh, I cannot get enough of this. The whole clip is on YouTube, and it's like, I don't know, three or four minutes long, and you should totally go watch it. But this is my favorite filter that's happening right now. You guys show them that. We're trying to, can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. <laughs> I'm here live. I'm not a cat. Just in case you were confused. That's my favorite. Just go look up a uh, cat filter lawyer and it's amazing. You can just prepare to spend about half a day watching all of the memes that are now happening because of it. But it is a filter. I want you to think about your filter uh, as the way we see what we see. So there's this thing in a cognitive behavioral psychology. It's called cognitive biases. And a cognitive just means how you think. So it's cognitive biases. Every single one of us have them. Whether or not you're aware of it, I have it, you have it. Every one of us have it. I, even once you're past the age of five-ish, everybody is walking in some cognitive bias. And this is what it looks like. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you thought it was awesome and then, then a few minutes later or the next day, you get a text from them, and it's that text that's like, we need to talk. And you're like, we did talk. What do we need to talk about? And they're like, I was really hurt by what you said. And in your mind, you're going, how in the world? I just told you that you were so pretty and smart and that you were awesome in every way and that no one could ever be as good as you. And, and then the person sits down with you, and they're like, you know, when you said that... Um, I'm never as good as anybody else around us. That really hurt. And in your brain, you're like, oh, I didn't say that. Like, that, that, 
those words literally never came out of my mouth. It's called a cognitive bias. I guarantee you that person has been pre-trained in their brain. It could go all the way back to their childhood. It could be something that happened yesterday. Pre-trained to hear that people don't think they're good enough. It can look like this. Maybe you had a really rough first marriage. Maybe your wife was awful to you and cheated on you. And so then you start dating again, but you date with the idea that this person is probably going to let me down. Every woman is prone to cheating. And it's not true that every woman is prone to cheating. It's true that you got cheated on. But not every woman is prone to cheating. But your cognitive bias will set you up to fail in your next relationship because you didn't heal from your past relationship. Cognitive biases are generally based on hurts or wounds or uh, even sometimes we're not 100% sure what happened. But there is something that needs healing. And if we don't bring that to the Word of God, if we don't learn to renew our mind, then we will forever come against the exact same thing over and over and over again because we didn't let the Lord heal the hurt that caused the bias. So I want you to think of cognitive bias in the terms of filters. So your bias is going to filter how you see the world. Two people, you ever, you ever watch this? Two people can be raised in the exact same house. They can have the exact same parents, almost the exact same experience, but they grow up vastly different responses. Is a cognitive bias. How I see what happened to me. And so we have been trained by this world. Some of us, it happened because of our parents said things to us, our teachers. Sometimes it's things we said to ourselves. It is not always something that someone did to us. Sometimes it is something that we allowed the enemy to drop in our mind and we held on to it. And now it's become how I see the world. So today, I want to give you a super practical tool to address those filters in our lives, to address the biases that we see. Our filters will distort reality. They will change what is actually happening around us. Have you ever had the experience where you are, if you're married, you have had to have had this experience, where you know you are so right? Like, I don't care what you say or how many times you say it, I am right, and you are wrong. And, and uh, I'm sorry, this is my favorite, I'm sorry that you feel that way. <laughs> First of all, that's not an apology. I'm sorry that you feel that way, but obviously you heard something I didn't say. And then the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and is like, hey, let me tell you what you said. And here's what we do. I didn't mean it that way. Here's my cognitive bias. I'm always right. Which was probably really hard to be married to me for a while. Now not because I got it fixed and I'm perfect and it's awesome to live with me. <laughs> but I, when Michael and I first got married, I was a little bit of an uh, arrogant person. And I was, I did not learn, I was probably year five before I ever apologized to you for anything other than I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry that you let your feelings get hurt. We should be stronger than that. We're Christians. <laughs> I'm so sorry I said those things to you. It's awful saying out loud in front of a room full of people. It's confession time. I'm getting rid of my cognitive bias in front of you. <laughs> now, here, here's another cognitive bias that could have happened. We've been married 20 years now, almost. 20 years. I would say it probably took me literally three years to learn to apologize sincerely to you. Like the first time I did it, he said something to me and the Holy Spirit had been just nailing me about, you got to apologize. Whether you're right or wrong does not matter. It's the fact that this person you love more than anybody in the world is hurting, fix it. So I learned to say, I'm sorry. The first time I did it, he was like, hey, this happened. And, and he doesn't, like he's not a whiner. It's not like, hey, you hurt my feelings all the time. But sometimes I would genuinely say mean things. And he would say, hey, that, that was kind of hurtful. And the first time he said it, and I went, you're right, I am so sorry. He was like, don't patronize me. <laughs> that is how awful I was at apologizing. <sighs> now, now, now I feel like you understand it's sincere. But here's what could have happened. 
We have been married almost 20 years. The first three years, I wasn't good at apologizing. I was arrogant. I held on to things. He could have, 20 years later, if he is still saying to me, when I apologize, hey, you don't mean that, then now he has a cognitive bias based on my cognitive bias that I developed somewhere, somehow based on something back in my past. Now, he is holding me to a standard that I no longer live at because he can't heal from the wound that I may have created in him. And then we get stuck in this cycle. And for 50 years, I mean, goodness, could you imagine living a life of 50 years of just cycling through every bad habit that you have? Some of us have done that. Some of us are on year three, some of us are on year five, some of us are on year 60. Today is the day you can decide, I'm going to break that cycle. Today I'm going to leave here free. So I want you to think of your biases or your filters, I want you to think of them as frames. They are frames that shape how we see the world. And maybe today it's time to learn to reframe what we see. We can reframe what we see. We have the power to do that. I know people who have had tr truly horrendous lives, horrible lives, that, had, that honestly, I look at them and I genuinely say, it is a miracle that you are just upright walking. Yeah. Forget the fact that you got your life together, that you're telling people about Jesus, that you have a healthy marriage, that you're a healthy student, that you're a healthy parent. Forget all of that. You should have been dead based on what the enemy had planned for you. Do you know how those people have done that? They reframed what happened to them. They reframed their own bad decisions. And then I know people who have had an incredible life and one, one little thing happens and all of a sudden they're all the way off the rails. Everything is horrible and awful. And you're looking and going, I just want you to go talk to this person who really did have bad things happen to them. And let's get you some tools to learn how to reframe what you think. Sometimes what we think is giant won't even fit in the frame if we'll hold it up to it. We have to learn how to use the tools that God put in our hands. Here's a couple of biblical examples of reframing. Here's what reframing means. I can't control what happens to me, but I can control how I see it. I don't have control of what happens to me, but I can control how I view what happens to me. Think about the Apostle Paul. He had a mission. God, he said, I've got to get here. This is where God called me to. He gets arrested and thrown in jail on the way to where he felt like this was my life's mission. Now, he could have sat in the jail and been like, well, God has forgotten me. He was supposed to be sending me here, but here I am instead in a whole different part of the country. I'm supposed to be going and speaking to the Romans. I'm supposed to be giving the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles, but here I am, and I can't do anything that God's asked me to do. Instead, Paul chose to reframe, and he said, every single day, they're going to take me for a walk in this yard, and when they do, a Roman soldier is going to come take me for a walk, and I now have a captive audience for an hour a day to share the gospel, and they can't go anywhere. How many people heard the gospel because Paul decided to reframe what happened to him? Okay, think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. God had called him and said, you got to go give your life for our children. And he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is uh, in turmoil. His soul was rent, according to the King James. I love that word, rent. It doesn't mean he paid money. It meant it felt like it was getting ripped out of his body. He was in turmoil over what God had asked him to do, not because he didn't want to do it, but because he needed to show us how to reframe. He needed to show us that in the darkest, most hurtful, most scary moment, we could reframe and Jesus, instead of looking at the cost, looked at the prize. One of the greatest things you can do is don't look at the cost, look at the prize. Don't look at today, look at tomorrow. One of the greatest reframing tools is just to say, today stinks, but if I will hold my frame up to tomorrow, I can make it through today. Jesus was an expert reframer. And I want to give you three tools to learn to reframe. First, embrace the stillness. We live in a world that comes against stillness in every way possible. I have two kids, 
I have one who is involved in high school theater and high school tennis. I have one that is involved in rec baseball and now all-star baseball. Woohoo! Go Timothy! And we are busy right now. Anybody else busy? You just think, like yesterday we had nothing to do until 5 o'clock and I did not know what to do with myself. I declared it pajama day. I was like, I'm going to just sit here in my pajamas. I folded laundry, which is of the devil, but if you don't, you have nothing else to wear. <laughs> but we live in a world that fights against stillness, and here's why. Psalm 46.10 says this, Surrender your anxiety, be still, and realize that I am God. One of our biggest issues is we set our frame right here. I pick the darkest, most scary part of my life, and that's what I choose to frame. It's in the stillness, it's in the sitting with God, where he tells us, hey, if you'll just move that frame down a little bit, look at that. There's some sunlight. There's some beauty. But if I keep myself so busy that all I can ever do is frame the darkest part of my life, a, a busy mind is a tired mind, and a tired mind is not equipped to view life through the lens of God. When we rest our mind and we be still, not just, hey, I'm going to go be still, I'm going to go read a book. I love reading books, but if it is not the word of God, it is not being still with God. It is in the stillness with him that I know he is God. And when I know he is God, all of a sudden my picture looks different. We've got to learn to embrace the stillness. We need to learn to stop. Okay, here's a super practical tool for you. When you start to feel overwhelmed by whatever is in front of you, the Bible says what the enemy meant for harm, the Lord will turn for our good, right? So when that feeling of overwhelmedness comes to you, let it be a trigger to say, I need to be still. Instead of embracing the anxiety, instead of holding on to that feeling of being overwhelmed, stop what you're doing. You may even need to just stop and sit down for a minute and just be still. Let's practice it right now. I want you to think about one thing in your life that causes anxiety, something that your mind is in a battle over. Now I want you just to close your eyes and I want you just to be still with him. You may want to say, Holy Spirit, show me that you're God. All right, if you leaned into that even a little bit, already you feel lighter. Already you understand that my problems aren't bigger than my God. And even when it seems like they are, if I will just be still, he will remind me of who he is. And that's all I ever need. All I ever need to know is who he is in the middle of any challenge. But if I have the, the thought that comes, here's the thing, it's our thoughts that define us. It's our thoughts. It's, it's not even, it's the word of God defines us, but how I think about the word of God will define how I think about myself. And so if I will learn to in every moment when the anxiety comes, anybody in here ever struggled with anxiety before? I got to a place where I was having like straight up anxiety attacks. I thought I was having heart attacks. And I had to learn that it was in the anxiety where actually the answer was. That God didn't leave me when I started feeling that. Because here's my personality. When I would start feeling that anxiety or have an anxiety attack, immediately guilt came. I should be better than this. I've been walking with Jesus a long time. I'm letting him down right now. And when that happens, I have now set myself up against the very one who has the answer for what I'm struggling with. Instead of just stopping the thoughts... You understand the Bible says to take captive every thought unto the word of God. Not just because Michael talked about this, but it's that cycle he was talking about. Don't think that, don't think that, don't think that, don't think that, don't think that. And then what do we do? We think it even bigger. Oh, what am I supposed to think that? Okay, it's not that hard. We got to just calm down. I tell my kids all the time, like, take a breath. This is not level 10 yet. 
calm it down, literally take a breath, and sit with the Lord. When the anxiety comes, that is where I found my, the, uh, I haven't had an anxiety attack in eight years now. It's been eight years, and it doesn't mean anxiety never knocks on my door. It just means that when it does, I learn to just sit and say, all right, obviously, here, here's how the Lord takes what the enemy meant for harm. My body is trying to tell me something that my mind has refused to ignore, and the Lord will show me what that is in this moment. And sometimes it's just, hey, you're worried about your kids in school today. Okay, well, what does the word of God say? To worry, to be anxious for nothing, but instead to pray about everything. So, all right, Lord, I didn't realize it, but I'm anxious about my kids in school today. I just thank you that my children belong to you, that you are their father, that you love them more than I could ever imagine, and that you promise we will be, you are our strong shelter. And I thank you that right now, whatever's happening, they're hiding in the safety of your wings. And then the anxiety is gone. And if it happens again in 30 seconds, then I sit back down and I say, Lord, I thank you that my kids belong to you. And if it happens again in two minutes, then I sit back down, Lord, I thank you that this situation belongs to you. And here's what will happen. If you learn to even reframe your anxiety and look at it as a gift and go, okay, this anxiety, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but just go with me. God doesn't send us anxiety. That's not what he says. But we can reframe how we look at the very thing that the enemy sent to destroy us and say, thank you for sending me that because it has alerted me to the idea that I need to talk to my heavenly father. And when I do that, Here's what will happen. The reason I don't have anxiety attacks anymore is because every 30 seconds, for about six months, every 30 seconds, I was sitting and praying. Every 30 seconds, I was stopping and being still, and I trained myself to say, I go to him with this. So now it is second nature. That anxiety comes, and sometimes I don't even know what it is. Anxiety knocks at the door, and I go, Lord, I don't know what this is, but it's yours. Now let's get on about the day reframing how you see what you see, learning to embrace the stillness. You've got to embrace the stillness. Number two, speak his name. Remember, we don't fight our battles like the world does. We actually have the one word that will change every circumstance. We have the one name that will change every situation. And I wonder how many times the Holy Spirit is just standing there. I I picture Jesus like, um, uh, like God's just holding on to his coattails. And they're going, just say the name. Just say the name. All you got to do, if you don't know what else to do, sometimes we don't pray or we don't say things because we think, I don't have those grand words that the pastor does. I don't even know. I don't know how to speak King James. So I can't pray to God. No, if you don't know what else to do, then here's my suggestion. Before you say any of your own words, because our words are not what the enemy will bow down to, but just stand there and speak the name of Jesus. Just speak his name. Here's what happens when we speak his name. Philippians 2 says, so when his name is called, Every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and below, and every tongue will confess Jesus, the anointed one, is Lord to the glory of our Father. If there is something coming against you, it has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. That is not about you. That is not about how good you are or how many times you sin today. The name of Jesus is the name above all other names, and it's not even an option. When I speak his name, everything in heaven on earth and below the earth has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. So if something is standing in your life that should not be there, then you keep speaking the name of Jesus over it until its knee is bowed. You do not accept anything in your life that is less than the price that Jesus paid for you. He is too worthy. His price was too great for us to stand there with things that should have their knee bowed to him. He is too worthy. And the call on your life is too great. When I don't learn to say, hey, I'm accepting this picture, when all I have to do is just say Jesus, and he's going to give me this picture? Now, let me ask you a question. Did this change? 
Is this still here? What changed? How I framed it. How I framed it change. There are times, sometimes in our life, speaking the name of Jesus is easy. I got a bad grade on a test. Jesus, I thank you that you just give me the mind of Christ. Um, My car broke down in a scary place, and I'm scared. Jesus, I thank you. You're my protector. I get a phone call that my child is in the hospital. That's a little tougher. That, that's a little harder. The life that I had thought I had built starts to crumble before me. Sometimes I don't feel like I even have the breath to speak the name. Sometimes I feel like I just got knocked down so hard on my back that every ounce of fight and energy and breath in me got knocked out. And it's in those moments, those that take our breath away, where he breathes new life into our lungs. And sometimes it's just enough to say that one word. Sometimes it's just enough to speak the name of Jesus. The atmosphere is changing. Nothing stays the same. Heaven is waiting for the mention of the name. The spirit is moving, burning like a flame, healing the broken by the one we proclaim. Raise it up, fill the sky, chains will fall, mountains move.
So sometimes we just got to speak the name. We don't have any other words. We don't know what else to say. We just have to speak the name. And then the last thing is we got to learn to change our perspective. And here's the beauty of it. The more we speak his name, the more we can change our perspective. If we will learn to let Jesus be our filter through the word of God, then our perspective can begin to get changed. Look at 1 Corinthians. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. Do you, I love the themes in the Bible. He just, from Genesis to Revelation, he is reminding you of who you are. He is reminding you of who you belong to and what power comes with that. It's not my name, it's not my strength, it's not my wisdom, it's not my words. It is his name, it's his strength, it's his wisdom, and it's his words that will allow me to change my perspective, not just my own human judgments. We have a promise that when we invite the Holy Spirit in, we don't just see through our own human judgments, but now I can begin to judge all things by the Spirit. Every situation in my life can be judged by the Spirit. Every battle in my mind can be won because I am looking at it through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Here, here's what I want you to do. A lot of people stop right there. I heard this preached for years. Not, not by you, but by other people. I've heard it preached for years. My, my mom and dad, my pastors are sitting here, so I want to make sure you guys know it's not them. I, I've heard people say, well, you know, the Bible says, who has the mind of Christ? So we're not going to understand. If we don't read the entirety of the word and all we know is what someone else has told us, I guarantee you, you are missing out on over half of what God has for you. He's, he's referencing an Old Testament scripture here. He's referencing something pre-fulfillment of every scripture in the Old Testament. And if we just stop pre-fulfillment in our lives, then we will never experience the fullness of God in our everyday. Who has the mind of Christ? Who has, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want you just to say that. Say, I have the mind of Christ. Say it again. Say it again. When that thing comes to you and says, you're never going to understand. And here's the thing. We're not in this for understanding. We're in it for obedience. If God says, do it, let's do it, whether we understand or not. But we have the, he is not this awful father who wants to hold back understanding from us. He's not testing us just to say, hey, let's see if you'll obey when I make it really hard for you. That's not how he is. He is the God who left the throne of heaven to come meet us in our disgusting filth and lay down his son's life. Do you think he's trying? to make it hard for you to follow him. He has given you the mind of Christ. We make it hard for ourselves because we don't accept it, because we don't put the work in, because we become lazy Christians who go, I'll just take the day of salvation and I don't need anything else. Salvation is the greatest gift that God could ever give us. It is the thing that we could do nothing to earn, that we can do zero work to get for, but renewal of our life is our responsibility. It is on us to put in the work do you think it's easy every 30 seconds to go, I have the mind of Christ. Anxiety does not control me. Jesus, I'm speaking your name. Is that easy? It requires consistent work. But here's what happens. If I will put in the work, then in the long run, my mind will be renewed. And when my mind is renewed, it is no longer work. It is a joy. It is just who I am. It's who God made me to be. I learned to quickly recognize what is less than his best. I learned to quickly go, no, that's not what Jesus died to give me. I don't accept that. You have to bow your knee to the name of Jesus. And it's not just that, but when I have the mind of Christ, I get to walk in the authority of Christ. So many of us run around and we're, we're just 
I, I should be walking in more authority. I should be walking in more authority. And you're right. I don't know a person on this planet who shouldn't be walking in more authority. But am I doing what the Bible says I need to do in order to have the authority that I want? I, a lot of times we want the results, but we don't want to pay the price and do the work to get to the results. 99% of people who sit in my office and don't, their life doesn't get turned around, their marriage doesn't get saved, their finances tank hard, their kids, well, they're adults at that point, they're responsible for their own decision. How they think about it ruins their lives. It's because they wouldn't put in the work. They wouldn't just do what the Bible says to do. You guys, it's easy. It's simple. God gave us the answer. Just do what the Bible says. We have the mind of Christ. Notice it wasn't conditional. You have it. When you get saved, his spirit comes. You couldn't get saved. The Bible says we couldn't get saved without his spirit. So we are now people of the spirit. We have the mind of Christ. But if I don't exercise my mind, if I don't engage my mind, I will always revert to the lowest form. Engage your mind. Engage the mind of Christ. And here's what happens when we do that. Our frame can be the very same frame that Jesus is looking through. I mean, how awesome would that be? In every situation, if I actually had heaven's perspective on it. And here, here's what I noticed in this picture right here. I think that Jesus doesn't really need a frame. I think he's big enough and capable enough and um, astounding enough to use the whole picture. But here's what he does. I just noticed in this picture, this house is upside down. I've just been looking at my picture wrong the whole time. And what looked like dark clouds that were sent to destroy me are actually just shadows of clouds that were sent to protect me. And you know how I get here? start here. This is a big trust. I get that. It's a big trust to say, God, I, I, I just trust that everything in my life, the things you sent, the things that you didn't send, the things that the enemy sent, the, the things that I created, the chaos that I made, 90% of the chaos in our life is our own creation. It's not even from the enemy. It's just we haven't renewed our mind enough to recognize that, oh, I did that. I'm going to stop doing that. But it starts by going, I'm going to pick one thing today. My goal for you today is that you pick one thing in your life to reframe. Just one. Start there. And then eventually you're going to realize you don't even have a frame anymore because you just trust him to use the whole picture. God's asking us to trust him in every season when we understand, when we don't. Because he's never once lost a battle. How can he lose a battle when he's already won the war? He's never once lost a battle. Some of us today are facing small battles. Some of us are facing giant, heartbreaking, life-changing battles. This doesn't um, make small what you are facing, but you just have to make big the God that you are facing it with. Sometimes it's still going to feel big. Sometimes it's still, you're going to leave this place today and that diagnosis is still there. It hasn't necessarily changed what is happening to us, but I can be a person who decides how I am going to view what is happening to us. I can be like Paul and I can say, God, whatever it is, whether you sin it or not, I trust you to use it. And if this is what it takes for even one person to hear the gospel of Christ, then Lord, you use it. God, if this is what it takes for my spouse who I've been praying for, for years to meet Jesus. If this is how you're going to do it, then use it, God. If this is what it takes for my kids to see the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, then I believe that you'll use it and you will turn what the enemy meant for harm into the glory of God in every single situation, in every moment, in every time, because not once have you ever lost a battle and you certainly are not going to start right now with me it is impossible God for you to lose a battle 
And so, God, we just say to you right now that you have our entire lives. Whatever it looks like, God, use it. And I just thank you right now, Holy Spirit, that you are bringing to our minds the one thing you want us to reframe today, just the one. You're such a good father. You're not going to overwhelm us. You're going to give us a starting place. And we just trust you with that. We trust you with our beginning. We trust you with our end. And we thank you for the strength in the middle. I just want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you're in here today and you kind of need to reframe how you even think about your life, the fact that Jesus came and he died for you, Man, he loves you so much. There's nothing you could do to break the love of Jesus for you. And today, he just wants you to know he's here. Jesus came for you. He's here for you right now. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you and to raise from the dead. And today, if you believe in him, then you belong to him. And I just want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've never believed in him and today you want to do that. Or maybe you've done it before, but you've walked away and now it's time to come back. Man, we're not going to call you out or make you come up here or say you're doing anything, but we just want to pray with you. I want to know that I'm praying with you. And if you're online today and you're making that decision and you want somebody to pray with you, I just want you to drop a comment in there. But if you're in the room and today you say, I'm ready to come home to Jesus for the first time or the hundredth time, I just want you to lift your hand so that I know that I am praying with you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're ready to come home to Jesus and you want to join these others, thank you. Thank you. Just one more minute. I feel like God is saying to somebody in this room that he has not forgotten where you live. That even though your life may have said to you that he has forgotten you, not once has he not had his hand over you. His face is turned towards you and all it takes is for you just to simply glance his way. This isn't about what's gonna happen tomorrow. It's about this moment. And I promise you that tomorrow is gonna feel different because Jesus is in it with you. So if that's you, one more time, and you'd like to bring Jesus into your life, I just want you to lift your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna say a prayer and you can say this in your heart. Jesus, thank you for coming for me. God, thank you for sending Jesus for me. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. You are the son of God and you died and you rose again for me. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins. I ask you to come in to be my Lord and my savior. I wanna be your best friend for the rest of my life. Holy Spirit, come and walk beside me. Jesus, I belong to you and there's nothing that can take me out of your hand now. In the name of Jesus, amen.